Okay, so let's get started again. And I'm going to pick up where I had left off on some of the good bugs because I have just a couple of um, bugs that I wanted to show you before we go into pesticide safety. So um, stink bugs can be a little tricky because there are some good stink bugs and there are some not so good stink bugs. Uh, this is a good stink bug. And this is why he's good because he has a rather long proboscis, this thing right here that he is able to pierce into um, insects or caterpillars uh, and, and suck the juices out, which kills them. That's a good thing, right? Uh, so we call these predatory stink bugs. And if you look, you can see the difference in proboscis um, size between, this would be like your kind of, your piercing sucking um, that pierce into plants like our white flies and, um, aphids and all that pierce into plants and suck out the sugary juices out of the plants. Um, you can see this is a little bit larger uh, proboscis that is made more for attacking. <laughs> um, so our predatory bugs tend to have those larger proboscis. Okay, so I want you to chat with me and I've got to pull my chat back up so I can see you guys here. Um, chat with me which one you think is the immature or larval state of this um, lace wing. So this is the green lace wing and there we go. So if you'll chat with me, um, I'll give you a hint and say that this lace wing has complete metamorphosis. So here comes some answers. I want to make sure you guys are all back visiting me and listening in. So I'm getting a few. I need the rest of you to chime in. Thank you. Okay, so in this case, the green lacewing juvenile is this one. Uh, B would be the answer. Um, A has, if you look, this proboscis, and A is going to, um, over time, look very much like it does right now. It does not go through complete metamorphosis. It goes through simple, so it's going to look very much like this. This we talked about before was our ladybug larva, and I want to tell you about these guys on D because I had told you about them. Um, these are those aphid mummies that I was talking about. You see how they're all swelled up? Like these are your regular aphids, these little yellow guys here. That's what a live feeding aphid's gonna look like. Uh, there's some other stuff in here too, but we've got these big swelled up guys. And if you have a little hand lens, you can often see <clears throat> the little hole that was made by the, the parasitoid that got in there and laid its eggs. So um, that's what they look like. So be on the lookout for them. All right. So we talked about this guy. He is the big eyed bug. What do you think is his immature state? And the hint is he goes through simple metamorphosis. YL, if you're on here, could you keep an eye on Q&A? Um, I'm seeing that there's some people responding there. All right, so good. The majority of you have answered and D is correct because it's simple metamorphosis. The juvenile or immature states look like the adult states. So you can see these look a lot alike and they look a lot alike a chinch bug because that's what they, eat. And so they kind of blend in, live with them, say, hey, I'm one of you, and then they eat them. So kind of cool. All right, here's our lady beetle. I expect everybody to get this one. Uh, what is the immature state of the lady beetle? There you go. Good, because we talked about this one. So that's why I expect everybody to get it. Good, good, good. Okay, lots of responses, awesome. Good job, guys. 
All right, so just if you need it, this is my um, email and I'll slide it into the chat also so that if you guys need to copy it or uh, send me an email for any reason, feel free to do that. We're gonna go on to um, the pesticide safety presentation. And let me get that going for you right now. Thanks for sticking with me going throughout this course. We're in module four now, uh, pesticide safety, and we're going to learn how to apply these products and keep you and the environment safe. So our objectives are to learn some personal safety when handling pesticides, understand exposure and hazards, and learn how to protect the environment. So hazards arise when we have a combination of toxicity and exposure. So we have toxic chemicals. All of these pesticides are considered toxic. All of them, doesn't matter if it's, you know, a soap or an oil, it's still toxic. So there's a toxicity, it varies depending on what kind of chemical you're using, but it's still toxic. And then you need exposure. So you could be handling the most toxic chemical, but as long as you're not exposed to it in any way, then there's no hazard. So you have to have the combination of the two, toxicity and exposure, then it can become a hazard. So toxicity depends on the active ingredient, sometimes the inert ingredients, um, the carriers and the formulations. So one of the keys to handling pesticide is to, of course, it, avoid exposure to it. You want to limit, reduce, <laughs> have none um, exposure to these chemicals. Um, you got to protect yourself. Most of the, well, in the limited commercial landscape maintenance license, the only chemical you're allowed to use is one with a caution label on it. So caution, means that more than a tablespoon can cause illness, where some of the restricted use, like the danger of poison, it's less than a teaspoon can kill you. So it's not as toxic as some of the restricted use products, but even so we handle any kind of chemical as though it's toxic. Things change out there too. Sometimes we take a caution label and change it to a restricted use label because we learn things over time. So always protect yourself. Treat it like it is a restricted use personally. So how can you get exposure to some of these chemicals? Well, it can come in through your mouth orally. You can inhale it. Rubbing your eyes can get it in your eyes or it can spray drift into your eyes um, or through your skin. So your mouth, some people think, well, how can I get in my mouth unless I drink it? Well, a couple ways. I've seen people who pour pesticides with their one eye closed and their mouth open and it can splash back into their mouth. The other way is, and please don't ever, ever do this. So your nozzle gets clogged at the end of your sprayer and you take off your nozzle and do what? Guess what you just put in your mouth? Pesticide. So don't do that. You can breathe in vapors when you're mixing and loading, or sometimes the temperature outside can cause the chemical to turn into a vapor. You know, a high temperature, some of them are volatile and they can turn into a vapor and then you, you're breathing it. Of course, drift. We talked about the wind blowing it into your eye or rubbing your eye, you're sweaty and hot. You have it on your glove, you rub your eye and now you've got an ocular exposure. But dermal is the most likely for a pesticide handler. Think about it, you have two eyes, two nose holes, one mouth, but look how much skin you have. So there's a lot more skin to be exposed. So it's the most likely to be exposed among pesticide handlers. When we are exposed, we can have some reactions. We can have acute effects. I say acute effects are not cute. They happen within 24 hours. This can be like a headache, 
<clears throat> a rash. Then we have delayed effects that can appear after repeated exposures to a product. Um, sometimes we just have allergies. Sometimes uh, we get a headache because we're allergic to something and it's not necessarily um, an effect of the chemical itself. It's more of an allergy and it could even be to an, an, an inert ingredient. Heat stress can happen. You need to protect yourself and hydrate. But heat stress and pesticide poisoning have very similar symptoms. Fatigue, headache, nausea, dizziness, fainting. Those could either be heat stress or pesticide poisoning. So you need to really pay attention. And if at all questioning what symptoms you're having, you need to go see a medical professional. Let me go back. One thing that you can't adjust is the heat outside, of course, but you can adjust the number of hours that you're in the hottest part of the day. So when you're out spraying, you may adjust your hours to just spraying in the morning or late afternoon instead of out spraying in the hottest part of the day. Chronic effects can show up over a repeated use. They can be tumors, cancers, DNA mutations. So again, you really, really want to reduce your exposure to these products. While we're here, I wanna talk about Roundup because it's made news recently. There was a court case out in California last, uh, in 2018, where a gentleman who was suffer is suffering from non-Hodgkinson lymphoma sued the makers of Roundup. His claim was not as much that Roundup gave him cancer, but his claim was that the label did not say that it could cause cancer. So he did not make an informed decision by continuing to spray Roundup. And he feels that he wouldn't have chosen that product to use or use that product had that been on the label. That's why he was awarded in the original court case, it was $278 million. I believe that they settled for $75 million. Well, what happened from that court case, it triggered lots of attorney action. So this is an ad, I've uh, blurred out the attorney name and phone number, but there's all kinds of ads now asking for folks who use Roundup um, that if they're feeling sick at all, to call for a class action lawsuit. That's one thing that generate, was generated. But another thing that was generated is something that you can be impacted by more severely, and that is the public now has a fear of glyphosate. So you're out spraying in a homeowner property, and all of a sudden they come out, <coughs> I'm sick, I don't feel good. It's because you sprayed glyphosate or Roundup in my landscape, you made me sick. So what are you gonna do? Well, first of all, this, oh, nope, this <laughs> is a fact sheet that we have um, talking about glyphosate. And I would encourage you to share it with your clients. It talks about the different rankings of carcinogenics um, and, and actually has a link to the site where it ranks carcinogenics. Lots of things are carcinogenic. Going outside and standing in the sun can be considered carcinogenic because you could get skin cancer from it. Eating red meat is considered carcinogenic, but it's different levels of carcinogenic. So this site will refer you to a website where it shows those levels and it equates glyphosate in the same level um, as eating red meat or being a barber. So there is a level of, I don't know if the word's carcinogenicity, <laughs> um, but there is a, a it is carcinogenic, but not at a very high level. So you do need to protect yourself, of course. Um, always protect yourself when you're spraying any kind of pesticide. However, I don't know that it's something that we need to throw our hands up and go running from all the time either. So educate your clients, give them the talking points. Um, we don't have a lot of other products that act the same or are as effective as glyphosate. So if they took Roundup off the market, 
I don't know what else we would use in its place. Um, you know, would, would we have to mix a couple of chemicals together to get this same result? Therefore, you know, maybe making our exposure even higher. So back to, <coughs> I'm sick. Um, you made me sick. How do you protect yourself from that? Well, one of the things that you do is you follow the label to the T. The label is the law. So there are instructions for mixing Roundup and you need to follow those. You get a measuring cup, you make records, and you use your measuring devices every time you mix Roundup. So that if you ever have to get on a witness stand, you can say, I use my measuring cups for all of my chemical applications. I always measure um, and I have records to back it up. When we did a survey across pesticide applicators, we asked them how much glyphosate they used to mix and some of them said a glove. Glove, glove, glove. I use a glove. I use a couple gloves. That will not do you well on a witness stand. You need to measure. Don't measure in a Gatorade bottle or a water bottle because you know it's eight ounces or 16 ounces. You use a measuring cup, you know, you, you consistently with all of your products. So here's why we really um, need to be careful. These are absorption rates. So when you're out and you're spraying, if there's any drift or mist floating around in the air um, and it lands, let's say, on the palm of your hand, first of all, that's nice thick skin on the palm of your hand. So that's only a 12% absorption rate there. And that's not very high. But let's say it gets on your forehead. That's 36%, so it's a little bit higher. What about when you head to the bathroom? The genital area is 100% absorption rate. It is very important that you wash your hands before you go to the bathroom and after, but definitely before if you've been applying pesticides. You also need to protect the back of your neck and your scalp because you can see that they have some absorption rates too. The back of your neck, um, is a thinner skinned area, so its absorption rate is a little higher. A lot of you wear ball caps. Um, that's not protecting the back of your neck. Not only that, but what do you do with your ball cap? How often do you wash it? Do you wash it every time you spray pesticide? Because that mist is, is accumulating in your hat and it's being held right up next to your forehead with a 36% absorption rate. So if you're wearing those ball caps, you need to launder them every time you spray, or you better, you need to find a, a type of a plastic hat with a plastic sweatband so nothing's accumulating. You can wear, you know, some kind of a bandana or something to catch the sweat underneath it that you can take off and launder, but a plastic hat with a plastic sweatband is a better choice. So let's talk about PPE, personal protective equipment. This is more for your personal safety. If your supervisor is telling you, oh, you don't need to wear that, those gloves, you know, you don't need to wear closed toed shoes, you can wear your flip flops and spray that stuff. You need to go to the label. The label is the law. Whatever the label says you have to wear is the minimum that you have to wear. You can always put on more protection, but you cannot have less than what the label requires. One of the best ways to avoid injury, especially, you know, mouth and eye splashing, is to mix below face level. This way, if you have a spill like in the picture, it's going to splash out and maybe on your clothes, but not in your face. So you want to mix below, mix and load below face level. If you do
happen to get exposed, you know, you have a chemical spill, you need to clean yourself up first, then you worry about the site. You get the chemical off of you and then worry about your site. You don't want to leave the site, however, unattended. So get somebody to cover for you while you're cleaning up. Make sure you keep people out of it and try to contain the spill first, meaning stop the glub, glub, glubbing, um, and then go clean yourself up. Then you put on your PPE and clean the rest of the site up. If you get pesticides in your eye, this kind of is a common sense one, <laughs> but you need to rinse your eye with clean water. If you get it on your hands, you need to you know, rinse with soap and water, but if you get pesticide in your eyes, you need to rinse with clean water. A lot of the labels will tell you for how long, flush your eye for 15 to 20 minutes. Um, you know, some of them will tell you you need to call or go see the doctor right away. Always refer to the label, but clean your eyes out with clean water. So if you spill on you, let's say you spill on your clothes, uh, you need to wash your clothes, um, or I'm sorry, you need to take off your clothes and wash the areas of your body that were exposed. So in order for you out on the site to take off your clothes and wash your affected areas, that means you're going to need to have a change of clothes to put something else on. So I hope that you're carrying an extra set of clothes with you when you're out spraying especially, but always have an extra set of clothes. I usually just give a helpful hint or a recommendation that you can put them in a like a Ziploc bag and put them in your spill kit, which we're gonna talk about in the upcoming slides, but have a change of clothes in your spill kit ready to rock that um, if you have a spill, then you have it ready. I know we all think we're perfect and we're never gonna have a spill or we're never gonna spill it on us, but it happens. I have one, um, one of my clients was telling me he had a backpack sprayer on and he was using a chemical that what he said was hot, meaning it burned your skin when it got on it. And the backpack um, sprayer cracked at the bottom and it linked down his back into his pants and his underwear and it was burning him. So he said he immediately took off everything, went to the hose on the side of the house and was washing himself down. Um, so hopefully he had clothes with him because he never would have expected his backpack sprayer to be uh, leaking like that. But in jest, as a, you know, for fun, he also said he lost that job because he was standing naked <laughs> and spraying himself off in the ladies' landscape. <laughs> but anyway, okay. When we're transporting pesticides, we always need to make sure our containers are secure. We don't want them rolling around the back of the truck um, because they can bump into things and crack them or punch holes in them and then they'll be leaking. We wanna lock the pesticides up so that folks don't get into them. If you have your truck up at the front of a homeowner property and you're at the back spraying and little Johnny rolls up in his big wheel and takes a swig of pesticide, you're liable. So you wanna make sure everything's locked up, not to mention that these chemicals are expensive and you don't want somebody grabbing your mix or your bottle out of the truck um, and then you have to buy another one. So always carry a spill kit, be ready for the spills. Do not transport pesticides in the passenger part of a vehicle. If you have a wreck, you're going to most likely have lacerations, cuts, and now you have pesticides seeping into them. So that's not what you want to happen. Or it could get hot in the car and the fumes could you know, come out of the container and into your lungs and you don't want that. You always wanna keep the label of whatever product you're using and the SDS, which stands for safety data sheet label, whenever you're transporting pesticides. You don't have to transport in the original container, meaning you can have other containers that you've mixed or, or have concentrate in um, and you are carrying in those containers three things need to happen. Number one, you need to have the container labeled with the active ingredient and the trade name of the product. Number two, you need to have both the label and the SDS, the safety data sheet for those pesticides with you in the truck. I've got a picture here of a truck that's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. I see all kinds of chemicals. None of them are secured. 
some of them are in a milk crate. I don't know if you'd call that secured, um, but none of them are locked up. And so they can roll around that truck and break open and be leaking as he's driving down the road all over the, the roadways. So that is the bad example there in the picture. Don't be that guy. So when you do have a spill, you wanna think about the three C's, control, contain, and clean up. And then we follow up, of course. The first C, control, is you have a pesticide bottle, it's tipped. Glove, 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 glove. How do you control the spill? You simply turn it up. That's controlling the spill. What if you have a container that has been poked down at the bottom and it's drip, 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 drip? How do you contain that? Well, you need to find a larger container to set this into so it catches all that drip which is really a good reason why you should keep a five gallon bucket with you as a spill kit, because then you always have a container to put your damaged pesticide containers in if they do uh, crack or get punctured. So one of the recommendations I typically make is have a five gallon bucket, put all of your um, spill kit materials into that. Put your change of clothes into that. Make sure you have soap and water to clean your hands or any affected areas from chemical spills. But the first thing you want to do when you have the spill is control the spill. So stop it from flowing. Then you contain the spill. So what would be in your spill kit to contain it? Well, typically this is going to be like your kitty litter or your absorption materials. You don't want to pour your kitty litter right into the middle of the spill. If you do that, you're actually going to push the spill out. You need to pour the kitty litter around the outside of the spill. You can see it in this picture here. You pour it in the outside of the spill and then you take your broom or your shovel and you push the material into the spill to soak it up. Then you clean up the spill. So you push it in, you have the material absorb up the pesticide, but then what can you do with that material? Well, there's a couple of things. One, you can apply it to a site that's on the label of the pesticide, or you can put it in a bag, label the bag with the active ingredient, the percent of active, active ingredient, and the trade name of the product, and dispose of it properly. Or if you're a bigger company, you can hold on to those. And once a year, there's a program called Clean Sweep that will come and actually pick up old pesticide containers, pesticides, um, those spill bags from you and properly dispose of them. Clean Sweep is free. Um, it's several government organizations got together to help prevent water contamination from these products. So they do it. It's not a opportunity for them to come in and police what you're doing. They just come and pick up your chemicals um, to get rid of them properly. So in your spill kit, you want to have you know, a sturdy container to put everything in, your absorbent material. This is something called, it's a product called Absorb, um, and it's the same kind of stuff that they use in baby diapers that gel stuff. And so you just use a small amount and it swells up as it soaks in the liquid. And you can see it there. Um, when we first started, it was way down. <laughs> I don't know if I can point to it, but it was way down on the, um, in, in the measuring cup. And so as it's absorbed the liquid, it kept swelling bigger and bigger and bigger. So the, the message there is if you get this product absorbed, don't put too much of it down or else you've got a whole bunch of stuff to get rid of. So we talked about this, but let's quiz. What's the proper first response handling of a damaged pesticide container? Well, you want to put it in a larger container. You control it by putting it in a larger container, like a plastic bucket. Let's talk about your storage facility and, and the environmental safety that goes along with that. Well, you don't want to keep too much product at one time. 
you only want to buy what you're going to use. Number one, that's good business sense. But number two, if you store products for a long time, they may lose their, their concentration and they may not be effective. But also over time, their um, packaging, their bottle can wear down or break down and it could crack and start leaking and you could have you know, problems in your storage facility because of old bottles. You want to store in your original container. You cannot store, you know, in, in other types of containers in your storage facility, like when you're transporting. You need to store in your original container. You should have good ventilation and lighting. Make sure that it doesn't get too hot in there. You need to have a spill kit with your PPE on hand because you never know when you're going to have a spill. Chemicals do need to be locked up. But if you have like a metal warehouse and you only have a small amount of chemicals, you can put those chemicals in a locker and lock them up. You don't have to keep the whole metal warehouse locked up all the time because you have chemicals in there. You just need to keep the chemicals locked up in some kind of a locker or storage area that's well ventilated. When you're done with the pesticide container, you need to triple rinse, rinse it out three times, and then puncture a hole in the container, put it in the recycle bin or throw it away properly. You wanna puncture a hole in the container because you don't want uh, somebody to come along and see that container and think it would be good for, you know, making sun tea <laughs> or uh, some other kind of food storage. Um, capacity so they you don't want them pulling it out of your recycle bin and reusing it for food so make sure you punch a hole in it we're, we're going to rinse it three times but now we have chemical in our rinse water so what can we do with that so what do we do with the chemical in our rinse water well we can apply it back to the site that it's labeled for or put it back in your sprayer so when you rinse out your bottle whatever rinse aid you have, you can put into your sprayer and reuse. Backflow prevention is very important. So what can happen if you're on site, let's say, and you're filling up your backpack sprayer or your handheld pump sprayer, and you drop the hose down into the tank, as you start to fill up with water, maybe the water lines down here and you have a nice air gap, but as the water starts to fill up, you no longer have that air gap. And what's gonna happen when you turn off the water? Well, what'll happen is it'll siphon the water out of the tank and into the pipe. And it's gonna take with it, not just the water, but whatever chemical you have in there as well. Any ideas where that goes when it goes into the pipe? Well, if you're at a homeowner site, it's going to go into the, into the home's water supply. So when they get a drink out of the sink, it may have a little pesticide in with it. So you need to be sure that you always have an air gap between your hose and the water line. You also need to be real careful that there's not chemical residue on that hose and then somebody takes a drink out of the hose. Homes more and more require backflow devices on each property so that the property can't contaminate the water supply for the whole county or city. Um, but it doesn't stop it from contaminating the water supply from that individual home site. So we need to be very careful that we don't drop the hose below the water line. Okay, so some other environmental safety concerns that we have is the movement of the pesticide off-site. This can happen a number of ways. I mentioned before about vaporization, where when you spray and it's really hot, some of the chemicals are more volatile, so they'll turn into a gas and go off-site. They can move sometimes and burn other plants. Drift, drift can be when we're spraying and it's windy, the wind picks up those droplets and carries them to other locations. We call it non-targeted locations because it's not what you're trying to hit. So if it's a windy day, if it's too windy, don't spray. If it's slightly windy, you know, just a little bit of wind, 
there's something that you can do to help with that, and that is adjust your spray droplet size. Change that nozzle a little bit. Instead of having a mist, make it more like a droplet, like rain. So it's a heavier droplet and it falls faster. Drift is 100% applicator error. If ever there's drift damage, it will be your liability, 100%. You made the decision to go spray because it was windy. Uh, you made the decision to use the wrong droplet size. Whatever, if, if it is drift, it's your fault and you can be liable. So be very careful with that. Runoff and leaching is when pesticides move through the water. Runoff is often from the surfaces, those hard surfaces like sidewalks, roads. Uh, if we leave chemical on those and it rains, rain moves over those surfaces and picks up the chemical and takes it into the waterways. So it gets into our ponds, our rivers. So we want to be very careful that we're not contributing to that kind of pollution. Leaching is when it moves through the soils. So we, I usually say runoff and then leaching. So leaching is when it moves down through the soils. Um, and again, it's moved with water. So if we over irrigate or if we have a heavy rain, it moves that pesticide through the soils. And if it moves too far, it can move down into our groundwater. In sandy soils, this is a real problem. There's nothing in the soil to really stop the pesticide and it can move right through. Sandy soils move water very quickly through them and it can get down into the groundwater. One of the things that slows down leaching is organic material. If we have really good rich soils with organic material, the pesticide can bind to the, the organic particles and it's less likely to move down into our groundwater. But if you're spraying in sandy soils, you need to be very careful that you're not um, spraying, you know, and then overwatering is happening. Uh, homeowners, a lot of homeowners in Florida, we've found from research over water. So we want to make sure that the irrigation is set properly um, or we're not spraying right before a big rain event. Okay, so that concludes. Okay, I'm going to bring back up my other here, let me turn my video on. There we go. And I'm going to bring back up my other presentation that we were in. So hopefully you got some new information out of that. Okay, I can see that. I'm having trouble seeing my mouse move here. So I'm going to do it this way. And back up here. There we go. Oh, but you're going to see the answer. Okay, I'm going to have to stop share and reshare, I think. Let me try that. Don't look, don't look, don't look, don't look. Uh, okay, <laughs> there we go. So in the video, I talked about hazard comes from combining two things. So hazard comes from combining two things. What are those two things? Can you chat the two things? So one of these and one of these. This plus this equals hazard. Any ideas on that? I see some people. Yep, I see some people answering correctly. <laughs> I see some people answering in jest too. Ha ha. <laughs> okay. Um, so most of you are getting it correctly and it is toxicity and exposure. You can have nuclear waste and as long as you're not exposed to it, it's not a hazard to you. Okay. Um, so if it's really toxic and you're exposed to it, then you have problems. But a pesticide is a pesticide because it's toxic, right? It's just different levels of toxicity. So all pesticides are toxic and you have to limit your exposure as much as possible because if you don't, then we're going to have hazards. Okay, there we go. Okay, another question and just type the letter into the chat. 
what is the first step to take when you have a spill? What's the first thing you have to do? All right, my chat went away. Where did it go? <laughs> Denora and uh, YL, I hope you're on here and helping me monitor chat because my chat just disappeared. Just like, give me a holler. Okay. They yeah. stay contained, most of them. Okay. Oh, perfect. Oh, you weren't talking to me. Okay. Oh, I went on to the next one. Sorry. I'm trying to get my chat back. <clears throat> it just disappeared. Um, all right. So yes, the first step to take when you have a spill is to actually control the spill. I tricked you. <laughs> um, remember I was in the video I had a water bottle saying glub 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 the first thing you need to do if you can is upright um, if you contain it but it's still spilling you've got problems the first thing you have to do is control you know stop the spilling from happening we have three three controls so we're okay good. awesome <laughs> oh my chat just came back oh I don't know what happened, but it's back. Yay. Okay. <laughs> oh, and then it went away again. Silly, silly. All right. What is the best way to reduce risks with pesticide storage? So just put A, B, C, or D on there. Um, what, what are we going to do to reduce the risk? Oh, I got, I got them or these. I got to chat back again. I, I think I figured out a, a trick to do it. <laughs> it's still not working properly, but I figured out a, a workaround. Technology is so fun. <laughs> okay, yep. Everybody's getting the right answer here, and that is minimize the amount of pesticide stored. You don't want to store a lot of pesticide um, because over time it can break down. And I, I said in the video bottles, but also bags. Those bags over time, you know, if you're storing granules, um, those bags break down, and then all of a sudden you have granules all over your floor, especially when they're stacked on a pallet. Um, that plastic just wears down. All right, when I click on this, I lose my chat, but I can get it back now. What is, I gotta move this box, uh, the first, let me move it first. Okay, what is a first aid measure for treating someone whose eyes have been splashed with pesticide? Just answer the letter. Good. Everybody's getting this correct. You didn't get fooled this time <laughs> with my blink rapidly. <laughs> That's probably the first thing you're going to do, but you got to go get your eyes rinsed. Um, the, the time standard that is like 15 to 20 minutes is what they typically say to rinse with clean water, um, but you always then go to the label for further instructions. Um, <laughs> So the label will tell you if you need to, you know, go get emergency care or call poison control or something like that. So, uh, but always, you know, no matter what, get your eyes rinsed out with clean water. And to do that, you have to have clean water, right? So if you're out, I know that there's someone on here who works in natural areas. If you're out in the middle of the forest, uh, where are you going to get clean water from? You're going to have to be packing it. So always have, you know, bottles of clean water that you can rinse your eyes or wash your body off, have, you know, some soap in your spill kit for your body, um, not just for the site. Okay, next question. Which signal word <clears throat> means that the pesticide is slightly toxic?
good. It looks like everybody's getting it. Oh, we do have a couple of um, interesting ones. So if it's slightly toxic, that means it's the least toxic of the, the four. So if you want to change your answer, now's your chance. The least toxic of the four. So little hint, D is a trick answer. That There's not a, a warning or a signal word that's out there that's toxic. It doesn't say on the, boy, that would be a great marketing for pest control or for pesticide, wouldn't it? Just say toxic on it. <laughs> um, so danger is the, the most toxic rating. Um, and then warning would be the next most and caution is the least toxic of our signal words out there. So the answer to this would be caution. It's slightly toxic. Um, it takes a good amount to cause harm. Where danger, remember, was a teaspoon or less can cause harm. Okay, I'm just peeking in the q and I know some of you are having trouble with the chat feature. So we've got you all taken care of. Okay, so I am to the end of my presentation. I did type my email in the chat. Um, so I'll type it in again, just in case you need to copy it for any reason. Remember, um, I'm a free resource for you. Send me photos, send me questions, um, and I'll try to help figure out what's going on. If I don't know the answer, that's when I have to start involving our researchers uh, and scientists to help out. So what we're going to do is take a 10 minute break um, and then we'll reconvene at noon and YL will be talking to you about, I forgot the topic, but it's something amazing, I'm sure. So we'll see you back at noon and thank you so much for paying attention for the first three hours.
Hey Michelle, if you could uh, just verify if you're seeing my uh, my screen and my pointer. I see both well. All right, thank you. <clears throat> All right, everybody. I hope everyone is back. We're at twelve o'clock, so um, hopefully I can entertain you for the next uh, fifteen minutes or so. So um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about uh, pesticide drift. And uh, it's a really difficult topic to just talk about drift itself uh, without talking about uh, all the other things that are connected to it um, in terms of environment affected by drift and the different consequences uh, legally and uh, personally, personal exposure and all these things. So I'll try to connect some of these uh, points together um, for you. So... Okay, go. All right, so with pesticide drift, um, there's a lot of different factors that affect drift. Um, the pesticide from the different pesticides themselves and their formulations, uh, there are so many different products are out there and some are formulated that they do volatilize and they do have a higher risk of um, getting, uh, being moved by drift. Um, or drift to other uh, non-target areas. And like I said, there's a lot of different formulations. Uh, some are more serious than others uh, in, in terms of products that are um, uh, high concentrated, higher concentration products that are used on crops. Uh, sometimes those are more dangerous because they're sprayed in larger quantities and um, they're higher concentrations versus some of the ready to use products that are sprayed at, uh, by homeowners or uh, can be used uh, without a pesticide license. So the drift risk varies quite a bit depending on the product and its formulation and the type of, the type, uh, the type of applicator uh, applying those products. So um, Michelle uh, talked about um, the pesticide label and how important it is. Um, the pesticides will will give you information. The pesticide labels will give you information on on these products if they're persistent or non persistent in an environment. Uh, that also ties into their their risk uh, for drift, because if you have a if you have a product that will drift and um, is persistent, the the risk of it and and being in the environment and the risk of exposure to non target organisms or people getting exposed to that is much higher when you have a non-persistent um, pesticide. And just to, so uh, that we were clear on what persistent means, persistent means is just it doesn't break down in the environment that fast. A non-persistent pesticide is it breaks down quite rapidly in the environment and it's generally um, has a reduced risk uh, level or rate. Also, um, Michelle mentioned the safety data sheet. So the safety data sheet is we definitely recommend if you're applying those safety, those products, you need to have a copy of those safety data sheets on hand and with with the um, with you when you're applying those products. Be familiar with the with those data sheets and and they do communicate those hazards. So definitely read them and be familiar with them before using those products. And when we say using those products, anything that has to do with these pesticides, if you're purchasing them, if you're carrying them, if you're uh, mixing, if you're handling, if you're applying, all of this is, falls under the pesticide use. So if you're doing anything with these products, make sure that you read the label fully and understand all those risks and the risk of, especially the risk of, of drift. And um, also have a copy of these safe, safety data sheets. And sometimes they're not uh, sent with the, with the products. You, know, you may have to uh, reach out to your chemical rep or the company that you bought from, or maybe download them online. Another thing that uh, you should also be familiar with, the, those pictograms, the globally harmonized system of communicating um, pesticide or chemical hazards. So you should, you should be familiar with these pictograms and understand what they mean uh, because you'll see those on the safety data sheets. You'll see them on the label uh, of these products. They, you will see them on um, um, vehicles transporting these. They're required by the Department of Transportation to be 
those vehicles transporting those chemicals, especially in large quantities, to be labeled with these spectrograms. So understand what each one means and be familiar with it. So when you see it, you recognize the risk of these products that you're working with. So let's look at a safety data sheet, an example of safety data sheet. Uh, here we have the Admire Pro uh, and insecticide. So this one says here uh, in the safety data sheet, do not apply this product or allow it to drift to blooming crops um, or weeds if bees are visiting the treatment area. So now, why? Are, what does this um, communicate to us? So it communicates that it does have a risk uh, of drift to uh, to blooming crops, and that puts uh, beehives into risk uh, because if they're if the crops are blooming, you're gonna have bees and uh, natural um, or beneficials coming to those flowers, and they will be affected by that by that pesticides. So. Um, be aware of your surroundings when you're spraying uh, these types of chemicals. So let's talk about the different contamination sources and drift. So there are two different types of um, pesticide contamination. There is a point source, uh, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a source that you can point to and you can identify very clearly. It's um, maybe some sort of a spill from a container, whether it's a small or a large container. Uh, here you can see a truck, a truck um, falling on its side and spilled um, some sort of powder, uh, fertilizer, or or insects or some or pesticide. I'm not sure what, what it was. Uh, they have a, a fallen pesticide container jug uh, on the ground, and that's a pesticide spill. Um, also, where you mix. Uh, wherever your your mixing area is, any leaks or any um, spillage in that area is considered a point source. So you can you can point to that. Versus the non-point source, which is usually comes from a large area, like a very undefined area, and a lot of the pesticide drift falls under under that. Um, and and drift, it, it is it is you hear about it more, and it's problems and lawsuits. And we'll talk about that in, in a few minutes. Uh, you hear about that more in large agronomic crops or areas, large ag agricultural areas, more than you than you uh, hear about it in the landscape. But it happens everywhere, and everybody gets exposed to it as a result of the drift. So that's that's a non-point source um, where drift is. Um, so. As Michelle mentioned, the applicator is the is legally responsible for any damage caused uh, by drift because of their application. Um, and in situations like when you have beehives or something like that, it's a joint responsibility uh, between the applicator, the the beehive keeper, and the owner of the crop to all get together and. Um, communicate the pesticide uh, drift risk or pesticide application in the area so they can eliminate or, or reduce the, the risk to um, beehive colonies. Uh, with the drift, we really can't uh, stop drift. It, it will happen um, almost always. It will happen uh, with every single application on a varying, level, varying levels of magnitude. So sometimes you'll have a lot of drift, uh, depending on the maybe the weather or even the product itself. Maybe it's it's very uh, prone to drift. Uh, versus some days it will be calmer wind and it will have only uh, drift to smaller areas. And drift can be in the form of spray drift. It can be uh, a vapor drift. It can be dust drift. And vapor drift is kind of one of the um, most dangerous types of drift because you can't really see it that easily and you can't identify that easily. With the particles and the spray, you can uh, you can have some clues or you can have some evidence of these uh, particles moving, moving around and you can find them on non-target areas. But with the vapor drift, the vapor is pretty much like uh, uh, products turning into gaseous state. So you have that gas just moving into the air uh, everywhere and you can't pinpoint where exactly it's going to drift to 
it just depends on the wind and the, the temperature um, in the area. So factors that affect the vapor drift that um, exacerbates the vapor drift. Uh, some formulations are highly volatile and they're highly prone to drift. Uh, weather conditions such as high temperatures um, and wind can move pesticide everywhere. And when we talk about temperature, there is one condition and or one um, phenomena it's called temperature temperature inver inversion and sometimes it can be um, a hard concept to get a grasp of especially to recognize in in normal life like how do you recognize if there is temperature inversion or not when you go out and spray in the morning so what temperature inversion is um, sometimes on nights where you have the ground is warm and you get the uh, like a cooler night then the ground cools pretty rapidly and it loses that, that temperature and rises up and forms that uh, warm air inversion layer. And that acts kind of like a barrier um, of, of, air, um, of air movement. So instead of normal conditions where air, hot air can come up and it doesn't move laterally, it just goes up and it, that's fine. On, on temperature inversion days, you have this layer Kind of forming this barrier layer and instead of the the air going up in the uh, in the atmosphere it just it goes laterally and it starts moving laterally and it can move actually it can move to several miles it's not just a, um, a few feet it can move to several miles and it a lot of crop injuries happen that way and a lot of uh, damage to um, um, Areas around agriculture happens because of because of uh, inversion temperature. So how do you how do you know if temperature inversion inversion is happening or not? So if you have a you need to recognize what happened the night before. If you have a clear night and the ground cools off pretty rapidly, if you have a if you had a, like a warm day and then a cool night, then that temperature is gonna that that cool night is gonna Pull, pull all that radiating here heat from the ground and create that inversion layer. So you need to recognize what happened the night before. But also during the day of the uh, temperature inversion during, or during the day that you're doing uh, pesticide application, um, if you have a calm day uh, with low, uh, low winds, winds are very calm, uh, and it's kind of a little bit still foggy, a little bit uh, overcast. That might be an indication that there might be temperature inversion conditions. So you may want to think about those days. They might be cool and they might be calm and they might be, um, you might think, oh, it's not windy. So it's probably a good condition to go out and spray. But you might have temperature inversion and that pesticide spray vapors might rise up and be hanging in the uh, in the in the air and then they start moving laterally to uh, one side to another and drift to other non-target areas so how do you um, how do you avoid that so maybe wait a little bit in the morning instead of going applying very early in the morning when it's still the sun is not up yet may maybe wait a little bit till the sun is up and the sun starts warming the ground, then it breaks down that inverted that and that barrier layer and it starts mixing air and air starts moving in a normal uh, manner. <clears throat> so some other terms that um, kind of relate to drift and pesticide movement is adsorption. Some pesticides are um, absorbed in the soil or bind to the soil particles and that's called adsorption uh, they adhere to the soil particles and sometimes that can be a good thing and sometimes it's a bad thing uh, sometimes it's a good thing if you're trying to protect your groundwater uh, from facade movement and sometimes it can be a bad thing when you have herbicide applications that have high adsorption rates and they will bind to the soil particles and they will stay there and they, they might be persistent too. So they might take longer periods of time. 
uh, to break down in the environment. So what happens is if you have a persistent, highly adsorbed chemical that stays in the soil for, for long periods of time, um, then if you have a sensitive crop that you want to put in that area later on, or you want to plant another plant in that area, then that plant is going to get affected with the pesticide. So sometimes it's a bad thing. Uh, let's get the residue. Um, so again, with the soil, with the pesticide movement in the soil. So we talked about the absorption, um, also the soil texture and soil permeability. So think about the amounts of pesticide spray that you are putting in the ground, because all of that in our sandy soils in Florida, all that are is easily moved into the groundwater. Um, just because of the soil texture is so coarse, the sandy soils are so coarse and they're so permeable. So you have all the dissolved pesticides, all that spray that moves in between those particles as fast as, uh, as possible and it, it goes down to the groundwater. So when you're mixing, think about also the volume. You don't want to um, create too much volume, maybe just enough to get good coverage on the plants um, and not enough to get washed in the um in the environment also runoff like if you if you have um if it rain if you think it's gonna rain shortly after maybe don't spray that that at that point maybe just wait a little bit because if you go out and spray and it gets washed by 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 heavy rain it's gonna go into the ground and you've lost your money on that you the application that you put out and at the same time you've you've been harming the, you're harming the environment with all that Pesticide going into groundwater and contaminating groundwater. <clears throat> so we're talking about persistence. How fast uh, different products break down in the environment. There are two things that affect a product breakdown. There's the chemical structure or the chemical um, uh, characteristics of the active ingredient itself or the formulation that the product is made of. Um, that that's one factor. Another factor is the environment. Um, hot and wet conditions uh, help break down products much uh, much rapidly. Also, again, another another um, top another um, concept to to think of is the organic matter in the soil, especially here in Florida. Again, in in many areas in Florida except if you were in a, in a mockery or something like that, the, um, the, the soil organic matter level is so low, so it, it favors that down movement, downward movement of pesticide into the groundwater. All right, <clears throat> so let's look at this example of the environmental hazard uh, statement from the label. So let's look at this uh, example here and see what it says about drift. So first of all, it mentions the toxicity to birds, mammals, fish, and asks not to apply directly to water. So that's a hazard to aquatic um, life. And then it has drift and runoff, maybe hazards to aquatic organisms. So it warns about that. And if there is, um, warning about bees or uh, drift um, risks will be listed in that uh, in that label in that section of the label. So another example: uh, this is drift and runoff may be hazardous to aquatic organisms in the in the neighboring areas. So it's another uh, one that is very similar to the previous one that we had. All right, dicamba. That's an example of a um, herbicide that is um, has specific rules in Florida of how to use it because of um, because of the risk of drift and contamination. So when you look at the label, um, so I looked at the label. There's at least twenty two times on the label that it, it mentions drift or some sort of a related uh, thing to drift that is that can be caused by this um, uh, crop injury or crop injury caused by this dicamba. So here it says may cause injury to and it lists uh, many of the sensitive crops 
these plants are most sensitive to dicamba during development and growth stage. All the precautions, restrict restrictions uh, listed below using dicamba. Another part of the label says use coarse sprays to avoid potential herbicide drift. So that's another thing too. Um, many people who apply herbicides, they do like to use flat fan nozzles and they do like to use a uh, 10 gallon um, uh, or a, uh, 10 gallons per acre uh, spray rate. That's really not optimal. That's, that's pretty bad. Because when you use very low uh, pesticide, uh, when you very, use very low gallons per acre and use a flat fan nozzle, then to cover the area, then you're going to have to use high pressures and then you're going to have to move faster and then your particles are going to be small and then they're prone to drift. So definitely uh, when, you're, when you're dealing with these types of products that have a high risk of um, drift, uh, think about uh, using higher uh, gallons per acre, um, not not too high, but reasonably enough, not not lower than uh, 20 gallons per acre, maybe. Um, and they they do mention that here. Keep the spray pressure at or below 20 psi. So you don't want to use high spray pressure because that automizes your uh, dr spray droplets, and now they're more prone to drift and the spray volume at or above 20 gallons per acre like i said anything lower than that you're gonna have to ramp up your pressure to get that's that's enough spray that you need and then the droplets are going to be much smaller and more prone to drift uh, you can use uh, drift reducing additives or adjuvants and we'll mention that in a, in a few minutes Another part of the label. See, like all of this, this is just so many different times it's, it's talking about drift risk or uh, sensitive crops and not to, do, not to uh, warn about the different conditions not to spray this product in. Do not spray near sensitive plants if wind is gusty and in excess of five miles an hour. Five miles an hour, that's, that's nothing. That happens a lot in that. That happens a lot in, in Florida. That's almost every day. That's that five miles an hour. That's super easy to get five miles an hour. So be very careful because um, you can get you can get drift quite easily with, with something like that. Do not apply dicamba adjacent to sensitive crops when the temperature on the day of application ex is expected uh, to exceed fifty eight degrees Fahrenheit. So again, here in the summer in Florida, it's it's much hotter than that all the day. So you got to be aware of your surroundings. Where are you applying? Where are you putting these products? Are you putting next to, is there a farm there? Is there a crop there that this is going to cause damage if you're going out and spraying um, on this the roadside, for example, and if there's a farm there, it's going to get drift on their crop. All right, and I do want you to listen to this. Uh, let me share my audio here. Share computer sound, okay. And I want you to listen to this. From getting rid of weeds and insects in your garden to growing a bumper corn crop, pesticides can help people get the most out of their plants. But Harvest Public Media's Madeline Beck reports there are issues with the chemicals. Sometimes they drift off course and may cause health problems. Pesticides aren't just in fields, they're in courtrooms around the U.S. There have been several lawsuits filed over dicamba, which for the last few years has drifted into unwanted territory, killing crops like soybeans and pitting neighbor against neighbor. A California jury just decided that the pesticide Roundup caused a man's cancer, opening the door to similar suits. And this summer, Ninth Circuit federal judges heard a case against a pesticide used on crops that the Environmental Protection Agency was set to ban because it may hurt children's mental development. The agency didn't follow through, which seemingly frustrated Judge Jacqueline Nguyen. How long can EPA sit on this? In August, the judges told the EPA it has 60 days to finalize the ban. All of this has some people who live next to crop fields worried. Yeah, I would be interested if 
there are issues or health concerns. That's Laura Weatherell. Her family lives next to a cornfield in Champaign, Illinois, and had the Midwest Center for Investigative Reporting put an air sampler outside their house. It's one of six in eastern Illinois to find out which pesticides might be drifting onto houses, playgrounds, and schools. Superintendent Scott Watson agreed to host one at a school in Bismarck about an hour away from Champaign. He's interested in the results, but says pesticide drift isn't something he usually thinks about. I grew up out in the country. I mean, I lived around farmers. I worked with farmers and stuff growing up as a kid, so I'm used to it. Um, and you think that uh, when you, your kids go outside that they're safe, then you hope that stands true, but you just never know. Some states like California mandate buffer zones for certain pesticides, keeping a distance around schools and waterways. In much of the Midwest, state mandated buffer zones don't exist. But pesticide labels, which are approved by federal agencies, often do have certain setbacks. Any pesticide that's being sprayed, it's, it's extremely important to read that label ahead of time. And Troy Kazire would know. He's with Monsanto in Western Illinois. He says there are other things to look for on the label too. Wind speed, the height from which the pesticide is dropped, and the type of nozzle used to spray. On a windy day, try to throw a ping pong ball at somebody and it, it, it blows away pretty easy. Well, you can toss a basketball right to them. And it's, it's the same concept with spray droplets. Small droplets or high winds can throw pesticides off course. But if some drifts into a yard, Kazire says it breaks down pretty quickly by design. And small doses are less toxic than chemicals found around the home. But direct exposure is a health concern which is why large-scale pesticide applicators wear heaps of protective equipment and have to get a license to spray. University of Iowa is a leader in pesticide drift research. Jenna Gibbs, a scientist there, says many of the pesticides notorious for drifting in Iowa either have some EPA-backed evidence of causing cancer or too few health studies to know for sure. We do know that all of them are pretty irritating compounds. They're irritating to the respiratory system and to the skin and to the eyes. That's at high enough levels though. Last spring, she and other researchers put 13 air sensors around Iowa City. All of them found measurable levels of pesticides used in farming, even near downtown. But according to preliminary findings, we don't feel like they're high enough to be a concern. This didn't include testing during the summer, when potentially more toxic pesticides used to kill insects are often sprayed from planes. But there are plans to research that in the future. Gibbs uses pesticides on her own farmland and knows the challenges farmers face. And she expects research and technology to lead to better pesticides and possibly robots. The more we rely on robots and drones, maybe we have some device that can go out and target really, really close and, sp and spray only specific areas. The future is nearly here. Companies are working on a Roundup replacement. Farmers have already started to use less of the newly banned pesticide. And those robots are hitting the fields, testing out pesticide sprayers. Madeline Beck, Harvest Public Media. All right, so I want you to listen to this just to reiterate the point that Michelle was mentioning in her video that <clears throat> it is not uncommon with lawsuits and a lot of, um, there's a lot of misinformation. A lot of it is driven by the public media and some of it is um, not science-based information. Some of it is actually the fault of the applicator um, working with the University of Florida uh, in extension for uh, so many years now, I have seen so many, um, and, and this is usually more, um, it's more pronounced in, in um, ag production um, situations where you get herbicide drift from one farm to another, and then it's the fault of the applicator and they will not admit that and they will try to hide that information and then they will try to say well it's not my fault then then there's an insurance uh claim and then the insurance claim is trying to find uh, researchers or people to verify what damage that is in the crop is it something that is out of the control or their fault so definitely be don't don't be that person don't be that person who don't pay attention uh to herbicide drift and then cause damage um, 
and sometimes sometimes it's it's really uh it's just the applicator hasn't just they didn't do it maliciously they just um they're not paying attention so something like we talked about with the weather inversion or the temperature inversion excuse me um uh, there is a question here that says does the weatherman or uf have um, an inversion alert system not that i'm aware of um i will look into that but those are one of the things like i said it's it's very hard concept to get a grasp of and it is going to be very different from one location to another um so i lived in gainesville florida for uh several years and within the city um driving around the city like early in the morning there's nothing there's no temperature inversion but then you immediately go out of the city, um, go on a little bit south, and on some of these uh, roads that are not not the highway, but some of these uh, smaller roads, and you can actually see that temperature inversion. You can see that fog layer going out for miles. Um, so you can you can uh, in many cases recognize it. Um, just just think about the weather that day. If it's calm, if the conditions are calm and um temperature is kind of um on the cooler side uh so and it's overcast so start start questioning that that, that weather that's not um that's not very uh, very good conditions to to go out and spray uh there should be some movement there should be some sun um if when when you see those those very calm conditions because we also say well don't spray when it's windy but at the same time, if it's too calm sometimes and it's it's overcast, then you get that temperature uh, inversion, and it's again it's it's not it's not an easy concept to, um, um, to 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 um, to figure out. I don't know if there is um, a way if there if it's reported some some somewhere, uh, but I'll definitely look into it, and um, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely yeah, it's definitely not gonna be perfect, but you can minimize the the problem. You can kind of pay attention to uh, your surroundings, and again, it, to to avoid that, if it's if it, if you see those conditions, just wait a little bit till the sun comes out, and once the sun starts warming out the ground, then you start breaking that layer, um, and and you're good to go. Right. Can you still see my screen? All right, thank you. Um, all right, so when drift goes on to non-target areas or non-target organisms, um, it might be that that non-target organism might be in plant, animal, um, or a beneficial insect. Uh, so usually um, for plants, if you're talking about, if you're talking about plants, most of the crop injury damage that happens is usually um, because of drift. Um, for animals, um, sorry, just let me move this here. All right, yeah, so we were talking about the, uh, we mentioned earlier the beehives. Uh, so when the crop is in bloom with some of these pesticide insecticides, uh, you'll see you'll see on the label that it says, "Well, don't go out and spray when the crop is in bloom because you have all those bees coming to the crop, and then you're gonna kill those bees." So, um, it's a joint responsibility again. It's a joint responsibility between the pesticide applicator and the crop grower and the beekeeper. Um, and even on even when you're spraying um, natural areas, if there is uh, flowering. Uh, what if there is wild wildflowers out there and they're flowering and they're in bloom? Um, don't go out and spray herbicides or pesticides. Just try to avoid that because um, there will be uh, there will be um, non-target organism damage or sensitive um, insects there or beneficials. You're hurting them. Um, also, for crops that are um, uh, blooming. Uh, you can also, if you don't want to, if you really need to put up a set application, uh, you can spray at night 
uh, to avoid when to, to avoid the, the the time where bees are active, um, and you don't get that spray on them. Uh, most of the injury that happens to animals happens uh, in the form of acute poisoning or acute toxicity, uh, same as humans. Um, and uh, it's usually because of feeding on crops that have been sprayed with these chemicals um, or, or drinking water that is contaminated with these pesticides. And something also to think about is secondary poisoning. When you have, if you have a dead animal that are already fed on, uh, that died because, because of poisoning due to feeding on contaminated crops, um, then you have the predators come in and feasting on their, on their uh, dead bodies and then they get secondary poisoning. So it goes up the chain too. Um, so it's, uh, it's important to recognize that. Uh, and the crop injuries, I wanted to mention, it's, it's called phytotoxicity. So that's another term that you might hear uh, instead of crop um, crop injury. Uh, also, again, to reiterate what Michelle was saying about pesticide safety and inhalation exposure. With the drift, a lot of time, the, the pesticide applicator is the first person who's affected by the drift. Um, it's getting onto you. It's you're breathing that. So... Make sure that you're wearing the right equipment, you're protecting yourself uh, as much as possible. And the label, again, the label will only list the minimum amount of, um, or the minimum required personal protective equipment. But that's that, that sometimes that you might need to go a little bit above and beyond to protect yourself. Maybe wear a little bit, maybe if it doesn't require an upper, an upper roll or something like that. Maybe if you know that you're spraying in an area that you might get a little bit of whiff of, of those chemicals on your clothes, maybe wear an overall. So you're, you're pre preventing that from happening and you're protecting yourself a little bit better. Again, with the, um, going back again to the same, same things that Michelle mentioned in her uh, topic and her uh, video, the toxicity. Um, what I wanted to mention here is the delayed effect and the carcinogenesis. Um, many times I, I know um, two people at least uh, that um, had cancer because of getting exposed throughout long periods of time um, to small doses of pesticides. Uh, one of them was uh, one of my university professors and he was getting exposed to that uh, throughout all his 20s and 30s and by the time he was in his late 40s he had cancer and he went into um, treatment after treatment and it kept coming back and it's it's really it's really bad when, when this happens so um, you might you might not be getting a lot of exposure you might not get you might not be getting acute immediate toxicity uh, but think about the long term uh, think about all the small doses that you're getting um, from maybe on, from your skin or from your clothing uh, not being washed and moving through closing into your skin again. So think about that. Also, um, be able to recognize that in the field when you're when you're out and spraying. Um, be able to recognize the different. Uh, type levels of poisoning because again you're one of the first the applicator is one of the first people who gets exposed to uh, the pesticide and think about the and have that that first aid statement ready on the label if 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 you don't know it by heart at least know where it is so you can go back to it as quickly as possible and figure out the first aid steps for that um, for this, uh, this is an example here that says, call poison control center or doctor immediately for treatment advice. So this tells me that there's a high chance that this product ha will have the word danger or poison on it. Because it's it sounds like it's it's highly toxic. Um, just because of, just from reading that statement right there. Another important concept, the um, organophosphates and carbamates, um, 
those are uh, cholinesterase inhibitors. And cholinesterase, what this is, it's an enzyme in the in animals, in insects, and in animals, and in humans. And what it does is, if you look at those two images on the on the on the left, the green one, um, so the nervous system, nerve cells, will send signals to your muscles. Um, to give them signals or orders to move in certain directions or communicate some sort of a harm or feeling to it. So these are the signals in black there, okay? So what happens when you have, we only have certain amount of receptors on your muscles or on your cells. So um, then comes in the very um, um, essential enzyme cholinesterase or sometimes called or the official name is acetyl cholinesterase this enzyme um, purpose or function is to break down those old signals it removes those signals and takes it away and uh, to keep the receptors open for new signals to come in but then sometimes when you get exposed to those organophosphates and carbamates what happens is um, that enzyme is being inhibited it doesn't work anymore then your receptors get blocked by all those old signals and the new signals can't go through and then all the receptors are now what happens when all of them are are covered with signals they're overexcited they're over they're sensitized so now um and this and this happens also over time so when your level of cholinesterase gets inhibited to a certain level you get that you get to the point that you're overexcited and you're sensitized to that and you can't um, be in that environment for 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 any longer you need to be moved out of that environment um uh, you can you can actually go, being unconscious you can fall unconscious just because of that inhibition and um if someone if that happens to someone they need to um uh they need to wait for their acetyl cholinesterase or cholinesterase levels to go back up before they can uh, go in and use these chemicals again. Um, and then the label here, this is a, a chloropyrifos and it says it's a cholinesterase inhibitor known to physicians. So that's that's very important for, uh, so so look at this when, you, when you're when you working with an organophosphate or, um, and it says organophosphate. It, it says that because Organophosphates and cholinesterase uh, uh, and um, carbamates, I apologize, those are the two different chemistries that do that. And so you need to be able to recognize that. Does your soul stem filter and clean itself to small exposures? Um, yes, but it takes a lot of time uh, for the body to recover and go back. Uh, it's, not, it's not a quick process. Um, so it's the same like when if someone is smoking, the lungs they get all the tar and black in, in their in their lungs and if they keep continuing to to smoke their lungs are going to get worse and they're going to stay that way when you stop it takes about they they usually say it's it takes about 10 to 15 years for your lungs to recover and regenerate those cells that are already damaged from the smoke and get back to their their original state so it takes quite a bit of time and, it, and it, it differs from one person to another. Um, first aid, um, some first aid basics that you should know if you, like Michelle said, if you if you get on your eyes, make sure that you have a clean water source to clean your eyes and flush your eyes real quickly. Uh, if you're, if you get, if you get a percent inhalation, get away from that area as, as quickly as possible into fresh air. Um, if you get pesticides in your mouth, make sure that you rinse your mouth very quickly uh if you on your skin or in a cold make sure that you shower and have a, um, a fresh set of clothing um also wearing ppe uh, so like we said this guy here in the on the left with the a uh, image a he's this is appropriate when he is handling pesticides uh, below chest level because um this will when the when the gloves are tucked inside the sleeves this will prevent runoff going into his arms because he's but if he's handling or, or dealing with pesticides above chest level then he should tuck in his sleeves so if any runoff goes off his gloves will run off outside instead of going into 
um, his his arms. Again, we all, all many of us do this mistake. Many many of pesticide applicators do this mistake, and I've done this mistake in the past, and I I definitely recognize it. Uh, wearing leather boots. Leather boots are not a suitable pesticide application of PPE uh, uh, footwear. Uh, definitely not, not appropriate. They will absorb chemicals and it's, it's almost impossible to get those chemicals out. And once they get, your feet get hot and humid, um, they will absorb those chemicals in them. All right, so going back to drift, how do we eliminate drift? How do we reduce drift? So with the different nozzles that you have uh, from different companies or different manufacturers and different types of nozzles and different types of patterns that you get, there's lots of shapes like you see here. It's lots of shapes and lots of colors. And these these do they have different functions those colors have different functions and those shapes deliver different patterns and different materials as well so for example this is a plastic um versus um aluminum or brass brasses and uh, brass is usually a little bit more prone to um, corrosion so it might get blocked more often so you might need to clean it more often so you might get exposed more often so you maybe don't use brass maybe try to use a, a ceramic or a plastic nozzle that doesn't get clogged that much and you don't have to um, expose yourself or maybe like Michelle said don't put it in your mouth and blow into it and <laughs> if, you've, if you've applied pesticides a lot I'm I can bet you've you've done that once or twice uh, with the different with the different shapes, they deliver different patterns, and these have different um, levels or rates of pesticide drift. So, with a flat fan nozzle or maybe a, a cone nozzle, so the the whole cone nozzle, what it does, it it goes into the plant and it creates kind of a vortex of that spray to go underneath the the the, the lower leaves. And sometimes, if you have high pressure in these that's optimal conditions for drift so uh, we'll skip that one because uh, we're getting close to time so I'm gonna I want to mention some of these so the different colors um, you have the those those colors usually refer to the uh, flow rate of these nozzles and so see here like the red is very fine um, the blue is for, and it's coarse and it, it goes that way, small to large. Um, so that's how you recognize the different um, sizes. And this gives you an example. Uh, what you see here on those, on those yellow and with the purple dots on them, these are uh, moisture sensitive papers. And this is a research uh, experiment that was showing the different um, droplet sizes and how they spread on surfaces when you use these different um, flow rate nozzles. So when you use the, the fine one, um, you get kind of like a haze, a mist on those on those leaves at two different gallons per acre versus when you use uh, a coarse uh, size, you get, you can see, I can actually distinguish the actual droplets. And there is a misconception um, with this set applicators that when you use a finer nozzle and use high pressure and you create that mist, the misconception is that mist is very efficient and is really good because it's going to cover, give you great coverage on the leaves. That is not true. That is absolutely 100% wrong. Um, the, that actually sometimes doesn't deliver the right amount of pesticide to your crop. Um, so and this graph shows as you go smaller with the droplet size then you get more drift so you want to stay below here you want to stay in this area 200 so the 200s are medium to coarse so you want to stay with these medium to coarse and and even very coarse if you want to and again this also this is another experiment that shows different types of nozzles some nozzles are way better 
So if at 15 gallons per acre, the flat fan, see here, it's kind of a little bit um, more consistent versus this. Uh, bigger, larger droplets. So if, you, if you're dealing with pesticides with high drift potential, use these types of nozzles that create larger droplets so you reduce the risk of uh, drift. And one of the things that we mentioned is you can use drift control agents. And I'll run through this part real quick because I'm running out of time. Uh, when you're adding adjuvants, um, think about the compatibility um, with your mix, especially if you're mixing multiple chemicals or mixing fertilizers with pesticides. Think about that because you can have incompatible mixes and then you can create crop injury or maybe your crop is not, um, your, your, your mix is not effective. And um, I will stop here because I'm out of time.